Welcome to a Parallel Project Training, APM Project Management Qualification Podcast based on the APM Body of Knowledge 7th edition. You should be using this in conjunction with our e-learning, podcasts and potentially a tutor-led course. For more information, please visit www.parallelprojecttraining.com. Welcome to another Parallel Project Training podcast. Uh, this is based on the Body of Knowledge 7th uh, edition. My name is Jan Underdown and across the table from me is John Bolton. Say hi, John. Hello, John. <laughs> okay, so today we're going to be talking about a business case and investment appraisal, a very important aspect of the project. So we're going to talk about the importance of the business case throughout the life cycle, the role of the business case, and also what is meant by benefits management, including the, the actual uh, process of identification, definition, planning, tracking, realisation, and, and also the money side of projects, the investment appraisal. Um, and this is sometimes an area where people actually kind of switch on, but it's very important for the organisation. So to start us off, John... Talk to me about business case. What is a business case, basically? The fu- uh, yeah, okay. The fundamental premise of anything is that you you don't do a project just because you can. You do a project because you expect the benefits that you're going to get in the future, and that might be a long time in the future, mm-hmm. outweigh the costs that you're going to spend now. Right. So no one in their right mind is going to spend a load of money doing something that's not going to have some sort of reward. Now, you can argue about things like, you know, how, you know altruism where you invest in um, sort of uh, disease research or something like that but that will benefit but it will be benefiting somebody it might not necessarily be benefiting the person that pays for it Mm -hmm. but they will they will be they will be investing it on somebody else's behalf like charities or governments or somewhere so at some point someone's got to make a decision that says look I'm going to spend all this money and at some point I'm expecting to get a return right or somebody might be getting a return and that somebody is in the pool of stakeholders that observe that project so if i invest in a new railway in london Mm -hmm. if i was to live in scotland i wouldn't Mm -hmm. see that as a benefit particularly in fact quite the opposite because i would see that as a you know investment in london when it could have been invested in scotland so that's the fundamental point so the business case provides justification for the project yeah but the the misunderstanding of a business case is that it doesn't justify a a project you don't decide what you want to you want to build a bridge and then find Mm -hmm. ways of justifying it it justifies the investment i want to i want to get across the river Uh uh-huh but there's a whole load of ways i can do that i could fly i could you know row i could swim so we have lots of options that's right so i could build a bridge Mm -hmm. so at the beginning i don't know which of those options is the right one so Mm -hmm. i've got to do what's called an investment appraisal right so i look at all those different options and i eventually whittle them all down to one Mm -hmm. and that one is the project that we're going to do now it might be that the bridge is the right option or we might decide to build a teleportation device or something whatever <laughs> yes. <laughs> ridiculous i know but i mean whatever whatever we choose to do is mm-hmm. the chosen project and from then on we're not considering all the other options we're simply considering the, the one option one option okay so um the business case really all it does is it documents all that right it, right. it says what's the problem mm-hmm. what are the potential solutions and why is the one i'm recommending the right one Okay, and also in the business case, we have to outweigh the the costs and the risks against the outcomes and benefits we're kind of looking for as well, don't we? Yes, that's right. I mean, you wouldn't do a project unless you you were were fairly sure you're going to get more benefit out of it. Right. If you build a power station, you're going to sell the electricity. Yes. People are going to be able to light their homes, power their factories. So there are benefits to be had from the from the construction. You no one in their right mind would spend many billions of pounds Mm -hmm. building a railway unless they knew why. And there's lots of examples of where projects have turned out to be Mm non-beneficial and uh, thankfully sort of prematurely stopped you know the the garden bridge in london was quite a good example you know it was arguably a you know a project that wasn't founded in a a reasonable business right so so going back people thought not i mean allegedly (laughs) so going back to the business case we buy the justification for the investment to make sure we get something back in terms of benefits so what else would be in the contents of a business case you talked about benefits we talked a little bit about risk we talked about options um and the reasons for the project there's a a term in there called constraints what would be the constraints well a a constraint is what you can't do uh-huh. I mean, the difference between an assumption and a constraint is, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm constrained by the fact there's only 24 hours in a day. Right. I'm constrained by the fact that 
I, you know, there, there is only a certain limited amount of access to that site, or I'm constrained by the fact that, you know, we haven't, haven't got the technology. I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to be able to teleport people across, you know, from from where I live to London. Yeah, but we don't have the technology, the, do we? Actually, train, you know, mm-hmm. but we just don't have the technology. So it's a constraint that we're under. We're constrained by the technology that's available, and of course, scientists are always pushing those constraints. So yes. if you're looking at a research environment constraints will be you know the laws of physics <laughs> or you could you know, actually have constraints light, you know. um like resources or geographical yeah, constraints that's right. Or... that's right there's all sorts of things so i mean you have assumptions you have constraints you mm-hmm. have dependencies and success criteria there's a whole section in the book about you know all those different mm-hmm. names and what they what they mean but i wouldn't want people to get too hung up on them but when you're talking about business cases you're talking about really about the benefits and the costs mm-hmm. of the chosen option. Right. Once you get into the project management plan, you're really talking about a decomposition of those costs. Mm-hmm. So you're not you don't really take the benefits any further once you finish the business case. Mm-hmm. Except to say that you might want to go back and revise the business case if mm-hmm. during the project you realize you can't deliver the benefits. Yes, or you actually have additional benefits you've identified. Yeah, that's right. So you might want to spend more changes. money, spend a little yes. bit more money to get yes. a little bit more benefit. Yes. So the business case evolves. It's used through the life cycle. So you create it at the beginning. It's generally orchestrated by the sponsor. Mm-hmm. Usually the sponsoring group's going to sign it off, the steering right. group, project board, whoever that is. They sign it off. And then that's the commitment for the money. Uh-huh. And then you spend the money and you do the project. And at the end of it, you hopefully get the benefits you expected. Right. And that's really the sponsor's remit. So a business case, is business case baselined as it goes through? Yeah, yeah. so you'll baseline the components of it because if you didn't, you'd, you'd be on shifting sand all the time. Mm-hmm. You know? yes. So when, when someone says to you, right, well, Jane, you've got a million quid to do that, mm-hmm. you can't go and spend two million, and I couldn't change it to half a million because it undermined what you're doing and you know so right. at some point you can change the baselines you can always change baselines mm-hmm. yes. through change control and proper Absolutely. consideration but you don't want to yes. go just willy-nilly just changing them for no reason so okay so you talked about the sponsoring group you talked about the sponsor the roles in the business yeah. case where does project managers fit in oh, i think it's a difficult one at because i mean the you know you're going to get to an argument about where the project starts and stops <laughs> yes um you you might have a project manager just to write the business case Right. I mean, it's, there's no rights and wrongs. You might have a business analyst. You might have the sponsor might write the business mm-hmm. case. So I don't, I don't see the project manager particularly. But um, you, at some point, the project manager is going to have to agree it because, well, not agree it, but sort of subscribe to it, if you like. Right. Because right. they're going to be d- responsible for the project that delivers the benefits. Okay? Right. Okay. So if they don't, cool. if they don't kind of buy into it, then then you're, you're up the creek without a paddle, really. Right, and there are other roles as well, like suppliers who can actually provide um, yeah. solutions or options for delivery, and the users, which at the end of the day would actually get involved yeah, with the requirements. Right. I mean, some, sometimes as well, don't forget that, you know, where, you, where you're buying stuff in, if I'm a supplier, I might write a proposal for you. Right. And that might be your business case. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you might decide that that's a really good option and you're going to go for it. Or a good proposal would give you, the customer, three or four options. Right. And that proposal is no more or less a business case than one you might write okay. yourself. As long as you're happy that it's right. I mean, you, you can't outsource the writing of investment risks to somebody else. But Right. Mm. Okay. So we talked about the role of the business case, typical context, and we also the roles are actually getting involved with. Let's talk a bit, bit more about benefits. Okay. What is the actual kind of process around the benefits? So we have to identify yeah, benefits, yeah, I mean, That's we? right. I mean, you, you manage costs in the same way you, you manage anything, right? So you, you plan how much you're going to spend, mm-hmm. then you spend it, and then you work out and make sure that you've spent what you said you were going to spend, so that at the end of it, you don't overspend. Do you mm-hmm. get that? So if, from a cost point of view, we, we create a budget, we spend money, then we make sure we're in the budget, and at the end of it, we finish having spent what we thought we were going to spend. Right. The principle is exactly the same for benefits. Mm-hmm. Because we work out what the benefits are, we run the project, but all the time we're making sure that we're going to get those benefits back at some point. Mm-hmm. So, so long as we deliver the project according to the, what's required in the project management plan and thereby the business case, you're going to end up with a project that will deliver the benefits. Yes, so if we, we said yeah. if we said that we're going to build a, I don't know, build a bridge that's going to get 20 million quid worth of tolls a month, mm-hmm. okay, if that bridge looks like it's not going to be able to support that volume of traffic. It might only get £15 million of tolls a month. 
So we might decide not to build the bridge. That's right. After we've yeah. designed it, yeah. So we might put prematurely terminate it. Alternatively, hopefully, we might get to a point where we realise that we could, you know, we're going to get that money back. All the time, you've got to keep the business case in your mind when mm-hmm. you're running the job. Right. So, so if, if certain things which are like volatile, like costs escalate or the project becomes too risky yeah, yeah. to the organisation, then you could consider terminating the project. Yeah, well, that's the, the business co- case that's becomes what, Well, the cost, that's the cost side, but equally the benefits might go up and down. Yes, absolutely. But bear in mind, you see, the benefits might not be for another 30 years or 50 yes. years or, you know... What's the what's the benefit of you know the Great West Railway you know when it was built in whenever it was you know yeah state of the art at the time but state of the art cost loads of money mm-hmm. probably overspent late and all the rest of it but you know now it's the, the benefits that have been yielded from it are, are immeasurable. Oh, well, you see the, the the actual change in technology from things yeah. like mobile phones. Unless of course you're trying to get from Bristol to London on a seven o'clock on a <laughs> Friday morning. Yeah, but anyway, you know you get the point. So. Benefits, the, the whole benefits process is no less or should be no less rigorous than the cost management process. Right. You identify what they are, you profile those benefits, you work out how much they're worth and who they're worth that to. Right. So, like I say, if you know, building a railway in London is of no benefit to someone in the Outer Hebrides, probably. Right. So, you work all that out, you add it all up, and you hopefully it outweighs the cost. Yes. You then plan to make sure you know when those benefits are going to be realised. And the mm-hmm. idea is that you always try and get them early as possible. And then we track them. So we make sure that those benefits are still on target. And mm-hmm. We have a, re- a line of sight between the benefits we're trying to achieve and the costs of doing so. Absolutely. And then at some point, beyond the end of the project, when the, when the project manager's kicking back on the beaches of Rio, the project's paying back. And yes. the sponsor's observing that. And the users are observing that, and society is observing that. Yes, and the, 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 hopefully that is actually happening because we've seen lots of organisations <coughs> where benefits are just not tracked. You delivered the output, and that's the end of the story. Now you mentioned um, forward um, investment um, things, which brings us on to investment appraisal. Um, can you actually describe what investment appraisal actually is? Okay, I mean, there's a general principle that. Um, so let me give you an example. Okay. Uh, would you rather have a pound now or a pound in a year's time? Now, please. Why? Because it's worth more. Why? Because it's going to depreciate in value. It might not. It might appreciate. Mm, the way things are going right now. Oh, yeah, but that's... It swings around about. It's a bit, bit like my pension fund. Yeah, it goes okay. up and it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. So so what about if I offered you one pound 20 in a year's time? Oh, that'd be cool. So you'd rather have one pound 20 than one pound now? Possibly, yes. Okay, what about £1.10? Mm. What's going on in your mind is a risk assessment. Um, the actual probability that I'm going to get that. That's right. So you're weighing up whether that's going to be worth more or less to you. Uh-huh. You're weighing up whether you're going to be around to collect it, whether I'm going to be around to give it to you. You're, you're weighing up all sorts of risks in uh-huh. your own mind. Uh-huh. And what investment appraisal is trying to do is to codify that. It's trying to put some figures around it. Right. And it's trying to say, it's trying to find out where your break-even point is. So where's your break-even point? Is it £1.20 or £1.10 or £1.08 or £1.07? There isn't an answer. Mm -hmm. But what investment appraisal is trying to do is is get to a figure. Because you're not going to get the benefits now. They might not materialise for another 50 years. Right. So how on earth are you going to place a value on something? In well, that's what we kind of call the payback period, isn't when it? Is, is, is when we invest into a project, how long does it take before we get oh. to, as you call, the break-even point? Yeah, but that payback doesn't take into account the future value of money. That's just no. a, that's just a raw num- numerical analysis. Mm-hmm. What, they, what the, the accountants will use is a thing called net present values and investment internal rates of return. And they're, they're two terms that are quite widely bandied around. Mm-hmm. Um, the description of them is in the book. Yes. Um, they, what they're trying to do is trying to get rid of the ambiguity about whether it's one pound and eight p or one pound and ten p. And also incorporate the risk factor in that as well. Well, yeah. I mean, that, well, that's what you're doing. You're doing yes. a risk assessment when you do an investment appraisal. Because who's to say not only when you get that money, but mm-hmm. how likely it is you get that money? Yes. Because most know? organisations have their own kind of percentage they put on. The, the actual net present value and yeah. also is the, is the um, cash flow going to be positive over a particular period of time, like five years? Yeah, I mean, they have a thing called a discount rate, yes. which affects a discount factor. And the discount factor affects their view about net present values yes. and uh, internal rates of return. Uh, it's not going to be possible in a podcast really to go into the no, nitty-gritty no. detail of that. But the thing you need to 
bear in mind is there are, there are three specific categories of investment appraisal yes. in, in the syllabus. Which is payback. Payback, which is where I look at how much I'm investing, how much I'm going to get back and when, yes, and what that, relationship with us. Net present value. Well, hang on, net present, and payback doesn't include net, the future value of money. No, absolutely. So it's just a straightforward payback numbers. Then you get net present values, which does uh-huh. take into account the future value of money, but it can give you some odd results, mm-hmm. net present values, because it's very dependent on the discount rate that you use. Right. So there's a third one, which is widely used, it's called the internal rate of return. Yes. And what the IRR tries to do is it tries to remove the ambiguity about what the discount rate might be. Right. So the internal rate of return is, um, you know, given at a set percentage, so 15% or yes. 13%. And that's the rate that the, in the, the, the business would expect to see as a return. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And again, but it's a form it's the, of risk It's the point at which the project neither makes money nor loses money. So it's a, it's a neutral investment. Right. So those three, those three are kind of, they're, they're not separate. They're kind of part of um, the same thing. Well, they are. They're they're kind of um, further elaborations of the yes. same principle. So yes. if you read the book, you take them through. You don't need to do the calculations, folks. Okay for this right. for the exam, but you do need to understand the principles of them. And, yes. You know, and in real life, a word of advice is get an accountant on it with their spreadsheets. Get your management accountant armed and mm-hmm. ready. You know, locked and loaded because. Um, the last thing we want to do is turn project managers into sort of accountants. barrack room accountants. Right? Okay, yeah. well, thanks very much, John. That was really interesting. All right. Thanks a lot, Jan. See you soon. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and found it informative. To find out about our training courses, e-learning or tutor-led course, please go to www.parallelprojecttraining.com. Mm-hmm.